Good evening and welcome to the January 2015 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, can we open up with the uh, roll call, please? Mr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Loisel? Here. Mr. Richard? Here. Mr. Stark? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Stanhope? And Mr. Massisso? Excellent. Thank you. I'll open the meeting with, uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance and then we will start the proceedings. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's a couple of homework items that we have to do before we start the meeting, so if you could bear with us. Um, did everybody have a chance to look at the meeting minutes from last week? last month and have you had a chance to review it? Yes. Why don't we take a vote and see if you agree with it? I, uh, I approve to, uh, to uh, accept it as, as written. Okay. Seconded. All those in favor? I'm going to abstain because I was not here. So I'm also abstaining. So that's three in the yes vote. Uh, second point of order that I'd like to go over, every year we have to vote in a new uh, chairperson, and it is that time of year, so if I have any nominations from the board members for anyone to uh, to lead the group, I would be open to listen. Replace them. That's one nomination. Like any other? Uh, nominate Mr. Maroon. That's two nominations. And, uh, I like the idea of that co-chair thing you guys did. Thank you. It was the... Best thing we could do at the time. It was our best solution. So. Well, Mr. Stark, I'd also nominate. Okay. So that's three. Now, what I would like to do is we will start with the first nomination, and we'll show a vote of hands, and we will do it by, uh, by numbers. And then if it's not a majority in one vote, then we will uh, come up with some type of a runoff if we have to. <laughs> so who was the first name? You. Great. Uh, all those in favor for uh, Mr. Loisel as chairman, say aye. Aye. That was three? Aye. Okay. The second name? Maroon. Uh, all those in favor for Mr. Maroon as chair? Can we only vote for one? No, you can vote again. Okay. Aye. Aye. That's four in favor. And then all in favor for Mr. Stark? Aye. That's three. So I think uh, Mr. Maroon won. He did. So more. <laughs> if I could, if I know, nice try. Uh, if I could be so kind, I will have to handle hand over the gavel for the year. And uh, why don't we do, why don't we do it at the next meeting? Not sure. No, I'd like to do it right now. I think it'd be more appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Like a Casper. Uh, yeah, you should. I, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to uh, to fill in for the last year, but I think really Mark uh, deserves this more than I do. So. No, that's Good job, the though. Good job. Thank you. I'm going to gavel out the meeting. I'll let you open it. Mr. Maroon. Oh, thank you. See what happens when you Can I have the moxie? Oh, that's Mark. Yes, I do. Okay. First, first of all, uh, this chair goes up right there. It doesn't walk. Yeah, it makes me a little bit taller. Nice. <laughs> uh, first of all, I got to tell you, I've been watching the zoning board meetings, and I've been on the board for a long time uh, before my hiatus, and I was really impressed with how the meetings have been run. I think you guys did a great job, and uh, I this is a little awkward because I feel like you guys have done a fantastic job, and it shouldn't be me here. It should be one of you. So just for whatever it's worth. Well, well run meetings. I appreciate that, but uh, I fully believe you, you deserve this. You have a, a large level of experience. You've done this for years, enough to knock you out of the seat. So um, I think I'll speak for Mr. Stark as well, as we gladly handle, hand that gavel back to you. And, uh, oh, that was very kind. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll start with the uh, first appeal. It's appeal number 2537, a variance appeal by Charlotte Lowell. Heard and Judith Lowell, 19 Vesper Street, Sisters Map U1, Parcel 24. We have a representative. 
Hi, Mr. Fisher. Good seeing you again. Good evening. Likewise. Mr. Sure. Chairman, members of the board, sort of deja vu. I know I'm dating myself this way, but long, long time ago, there was a soap opera on evening television called Dallas, where one year just kind of became a dream, and then everything came back after that year. <laughs> this is the deja vu. I get it back up here and I say, wait a minute, this looks like it did about a year ago. <laughs> Except last year was more like a nightmare, wasn't it? Uh, no, I wouldn't go that far at all. But, uh, the, the, the soap opera went very nicely as well, but it's great to see everybody, and, and uh, thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. I'm here this evening representing uh, Ms. Hurd and Ms. Lowell, both of whom are with us this evening, uh, in our uh, appeal for a hardship variance, primarily because a portion of this property is in the Shoreland Zone, not all of it, but um, about half of the, the back house, I'll call it, which is uh, this uh, cottage right here. Um, and you'll see on your plans that uh, a portion of the Shoreland Zone goes through that. The rest of it does not. But nevertheless, because a portion of the property is in the Shoreland Zone, that's why we're here for a hardship variance. Um, many of us will recall that uh, we've been here, or I've been here in similar circumstances in the past regarding a functional division. Brian was absolutely, the codes officer was absolutely correct in stating that there is no functional division variance. Um, that's not, it uh, wasn't the intention of portraying it that way. That's why we uh, submitted the criteria for a hardship variance. Um, but pursuant to uh, the functional division um, aspect of the Supreme Court decision, uh, which is not germane to every single situation of this uh, type, but uh, we do believe it is here, and we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, precedent-setting history uh, up and down the coast. Uh, we've done, uh, at last count this afternoon, we actually did uh, 32 divisions such as this one, most of them in Wells, as you can imagine. Um, and we've done eight here in Scarborough. This is uh, doing hardship or practical difficulty variances relative to a functional division. The functional division being basically that there is more than one completely habitable uh, house that is on, it could be multiple houses, could be at least two, that are on one specific property. And for whatever reasons, those houses would then be, or those properties would then be split as equitably as possible with access and um, frontage and area. Uh, being as equitable for each property as we can make it uh, relative to that split that was the result of a Supreme Court decision back in, I believe it was, well, Brian would know better than I, I think it was back in 1982. Um, these houses, and I took, I'm not an attorney, but we do a lot with survey law, and uh, we took a look at that criteria, and from that aspect, I do believe we meet everything. That the houses were uh, actually uh, built uh, back in the first half of the last century, uh, they had to have been in existence prior to 1974. They have been. They had to have been uh, completed. They couldn't be a, a, a nice house up front and a garage in the back kind of thing. They had to actually be individually habitable houses, which they have been. They had to either be lived in by the owners or uh, tenanted out as uh, to, um, to lessors, uh, lessees, excuse me, over the years on a continual basis. They have been. Uh, they meet all the criteria as far as being able to split it off. If we could split it off tomorrow, uh, they would be able to stand on their own, to be sure. Uh, the issue that we have is this is not the first opportunity that, uh, I'll, I'll refer to the family as the Lowell's, um, that they wanted to uh, try to split this. They wanted to try to sell the property uh, that was originally, I believe, the first house, uh, the law was created in, in the 20s. The first house was built around that period. The second house came afterwards. Uh, but uh, they've tried to sell the property uh, since they no longer really, it, it, it's not the young children in the family situation that it used to be during the, the course of the last 80 years when it's been in their family. Um, so they wanted to try to divest themselves of the property, and they've had quite a bit of interest in either one, but not both. So the issue before us, uh, which is a similar situation as the functional division from the Saco River case, uh, is that we've got two freestanding houses that could certainly exist on their own, but there's no interest in anybody who has looked at these over the last several years to buy both. Uh, whether it's a financing situation or somebody just saying, I want one cottage, but I don't want the other, whatever the reason, uh, they've had many uh, people who are interested, but uh, then they walk away when they find out that it's all one property. So toward that end, pursuant to a hardship variance, we would like to be able to split the property or propose to do that as you see on your, um, uh, in your packets, on the plan in your packets. Uh, that division has not yet been made, obviously. That's the reason why we're here. Uh, but we would propose to make these lots, again, as equitable as possible, providing frontage for both of them, providing access on Vesper Street to both of them. They both have and have had for numerous decades their own addresses, 
One is at number 17, one is at number 19. Everybody basically construes these as two separate entities except for the fact that they're on one parcel. So again, in the interest of brevity, um, I'd like to be able to just state, we'd simply like to be able to split the lot. Uh, it would be a further non legal but non-conforming lot, which is why we're here. Uh, but again, we can't sell this, so the economics of the situation are they're almost valueless properties because as beautiful as they are, nobody wants to buy them. Uh, and they can, the family cannot sell them the way they are. So we'd like to be able to uh, entertain and go through the regulations and pursuant to any questions that I can answer and see if we may be able to uh, receive that variance from the board to be able to split that property and sell them each individually. I will before Thank we do that. Um, Mr. Lonsford, do you have any comments? Or? Uh, my staff comments to the, to the board, um, just again reminding them that it does have to meet all of the, the same criteria as the case law in order to be con uh, considered. Um, for this request, um, and more importantly, that you have to consider it just as we would any other variant. It has to meet all of the four standards for hardship, undue hardship, um, and uh, that's really where it lies. I mean, the functional division part of it is not um, not really applicable here. It's, it's, does it stand on its own based on the, the test for undue hardship? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not open to public. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this? Nobody from the public wish to speak? I'll close the public hearing part. Not so quick. We have two comments. Oh, I'll get two letters. Yeah. yeah. I'll read these in here. Uh, this is uh, two letters uh, dated November 3rd and November 12th, respectively. Uh, would you please, let's see. This is from uh, Lynn Schrock. I live at Higgins Beach neighborhood at 15 Champion Street and received notice of the upcoming appeals hearing. I want to respectfully go on record as being opposed to granting the variance that is subject of the appeal. And uh, the next one is from uh, Rosemary Schur. Uh, we are opposed to the division of the existing non-conforming parcel containing two single-family dwellings because of the resulting lot sizes. It sets a precedent for many other similar properties at Higgins Beach. For example, please review the uh, Zinchuk property at 7 Vesper Street. Uh, no other letters. Hey, what's the call. address on that, Mr. Murray? I'm sorry, this is 7 Cliff Street and 36 Bay Bayview Avenue. Okay. That's uh, Paul and Mary Rosemary Schur. Uh, any other phone calls? Or? Okay, none. <coughs> so uh, I'll close the public hearing part. I'm going to go to the board for questions before we go through the, uh, through the requirements, and then we'll go to the requirements. Mr. Fisher, uh, do each of these have their own septic system? It's a public system down there. It is public, okay. Yes. Yes, water and sewer. And can you show me where the driveway access is? Yes. Um, Vesper Street is right here. The driveway is in this section. The driveway only comes up to this point right here and then stops. Um, so what we're there's also a small driveway over here. Um, so what we're proposing is that this driveway on this side would actually go, as you can see, this panhandle would go with the cottage that's here, and then this driveway over here would um, go with the the front cottage. And, and, uh, how much space is between the uh, front house there and the and the uh, property line? At the on, point? on this side? Yes. Uh, from this, from what would well the house. About 6.75 feet. Really not enough for a car? Uh, not when you get to the back. To the front in this section right in here, this is where it, um, most of the people will, pi will park right now. This has been, these cottages have been um, leased for or with summer rentals when uh, Ms. Lowell and Ms. Hurd have not actually lived there themselves during the summertime uh, for decades. And typically the way they've worked it is anybody who's coming in to uh, rent separately the back cottage, pulls right in here. Uh, this was a room for two cars off street. This is where they, they do park. And then the uh, vehicles for this uh, cottage right here do park in this section. It's narrow, but you can get a car in there. Are the board questions? So we'll start with the... Mr. Richard? No. I've got several. Part of the decision that we're going to have to make here, which I believe is going to be difficult from my standpoint, is that 
there's several points of proof that you're going to have to uh, get the board members to agree with. And if I could go through those, and I'm going to read part of um, our guidelines on what we're deciding this decision based on, excuse me. Um, it says, where a single parcel of land has been developed with a number of buildings prior to the effective date of the ordinance. And I think you meet that. And the buildings had all been used for distinct and separate uses prior to that date. How would you say and prove that that is the case? Uh, typically, if a building is divided, if it's a common building and then it is divided within that building, it's not likely that it would pass the straight face test toward that criteria. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, we've got literally two completely separate houses, neither one of which is dependent on the other, on the same property. So toward that end, I do believe they meet that criteria in that if one were if nobody rented one and it were vacant for a week or a month or whatever, the other one is perfectly viable and back and forth. I would need some more information. T toward what end? T in Because what you said is if it were a common building, clearly these have not been common buildings. They've been separate. They've always been separate. Right. Um, has it been the same family that's been using it? Has it been different families? When, if it's been rented, when did the renting start? How has the renting, renting been conducted? Those kind of details back in history, back to 50s, sure. is information that I would like to have. Because if we grant this, this could pre set precedents in areas that we may not want to go. Um, I, I understand, mm -hmm. and anything in the past precedent setting or otherwise does not indicate anything going forward in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there has been, so I'll eat my words, and there has been quite a, a bit of precedent that we have had. In fact, uh, with one exception down in the Pine Point area, the other seven of these that we've actually done, seven of these meaning multiple buildings on one property that we've divided had all been <coughs> Chicken's Beach. Uh, one of the relatively recent ones a couple of years ago was right on Ocean Avenue where we had three cottages, uh, a, a somewhat larger home, but still a small home, and then two very small cottages. And uh, we were able to divide those as well. And they were always uh, separate as well um, from the time that they were actually constructed. They were either lived in by the same family or rented out, uh, and they could stand on their own, so there was no issue toward that end. The point being is that, and this also gets into one of the comments on the letters, there's not really a precedent here. The precedent was set a long, long time ago, I think even before this board was here. Uh, we started doing these actually almost 20 years ago, and uh, toward the end, whether it's literally functional division or otherwise, what we have is the criteria that I think would meet these standards based on the functional division because they have been, and by the way, because the family, it, it's always been in the family since the 20s, actually when the house was built, the original house, um, and the family is here this evening to be able to, uh, to and gravitas to that and answer some of those questions. It has been either lived in literally by a member of the family over that entire period or occupied by a tenant, uh, typically on a seasonal basis. That's what most of Higgins Beach is like. Uh, but it's been every year since the family has owned it. And this is the only family that has owned that property since it was created. Uh, the sewer is connected to the town sewer system. That's correct. Are there two separate connections or common that feed that one connection to the street? Both of those go to the street. Same thing with water, two separate water connections that come in. One. What about power? Two separate power connections that come in, but the water is a single entity. Okay. Just so that we get that on record, um, could you just repeat their answers for the, for the board? Yes. Uh, the questions were about the utilities servicing both properties. There are two separate uh, um, sewer lines. There are two separate power lines. There is one water line that could very easily be separated. Uh, apparently, well, I guess the water goes through the front house to the back house. Um, that's very easy to separate. In fact, that's the easiest thing to separate is a water line. Okay. I'm going to yield, and then I have more questions. Just let me formulate my thoughts. Certainly. Other questions from the board? We'll go into the um, requirements. Or would you like to continue asking questions before we do No, that? go right ahead. I can come back to it. Okay. So the, uh, the first requirement is that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a, var unless a variance is granted. But that is correct. Uh, with two cottages on the same lot, no one over the past several years of the property being marketed actively for sale has expressed any interest in purchasing the lot with both houses on it. 
therefore, by exercising their legal right to functionally divide the property, but notwithstanding that fact, uh, the family would like to separate the two cottages with each on its own lot in order to be able to yield any return. The problem that they've had recently is that uh, they have, again, buyers, interested buyers for either one, but not both. So it gets to the point where if they wanted to sell their property now or five years from now, it doesn't look like there's much of a market for somebody to buy two separate houses on one property. Hence, the economic value of the, and the hardship is that they, they want to sell the property. They've been actively trying to sell it for the past three years, and they've had no interest. Okay, and the next item is that the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property, not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Also correct. Uh, this is fairly obvious by the fact that there are two houses on one lot, which is indeed a unique circumstance and has nothing to do whatsoever with the general conditions of the neighborhood. And the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. That's indeed correct. There are, there's no uh, proposed physical change to either one of the structures on the property. So as far as visual character, which also leads to another uh, a retort to or reply to one of the uh, letters, uh, nothing is going to change physically out there. You drive by yesterday or drive by tomorrow or three years from now or whatever the situation may be, uh, nothing as far as neighborhood character is going to look any different than it does right now. So it's just simply a line that nobody will see. And, uh, excuse me, the last is the uh, hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Um, it, in effect, no, because there was no zoning in effect at the time that these houses were built by a long shot. Uh, so really the, the hardship has become the result of zoning overtaking an area that was not zoned against this uh, that then prohibited two houses. You couldn't do this today. In other words, you couldn't build two houses on one lot. Um, so it is in effect uh, because of the zoning not because of the appellant. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's come back to the board for questions, comments. I, I have a tough time with the first one, to be honest with you, Jim. I, they, they, it's got it's to meet all four points. The first one, I'm, I'm having a tough time swallowing. I, I think it's a unique situation, no doubt. I think selling two garages on one lot, not the norm, but it's not a hurdle that's that can't be, you know, it can't be met, that's for sure. That's, that's my feeling on that. I mean, it's probably that, and I'm, uh, you know, I look at the map, I'm not I'm not in love with the access to it either. I know that doesn't fall within the criteria, these four these four questions you just answered, but the, the, the parking seems to be even a bit of an issue to me to service two houses adequately. It seems like one's half on the lot, the neighboring lot, and the other really, the, it's really just a, sliver of land between the cottages to access the back cottages. I don't like that aspect of it either. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Question around the deed. <coughs> the deed defined this lot or this property as one single property, correct? It never referenced potential for two properties. The deed is written as if it was one single lot. The deed refers to the original subdivision plan, which is the lot that was on that one lot. plan. Yes. Okay. Um, my, my other comment is w when dividing up a piece of property, if it naturally looks from the street as if it were two properties, to me it makes it much easier. In other words, if the buildings were side by side, not stacked visually, <clears throat> to me it would be easier to divide. I'm struggling with the second building being so far behind the others and the closeness in proximity to the buildings next to it on the lots on either side, it crowds it out. So it's almost like it doesn't come across like it's a natural separate building. I can certainly understand the observation. Um, it doesn't change anything physically from what's been there for 60 some odd years or more than that. Um, you're right, it's a lot easier to look at something and saying there's two houses that look like they ought to be sitting on their own properties. If you don't see that from the street, is that a, it's a rhetorical question, but is that a, a criteria to say that, well, it doesn't look like two separate houses even though it is? Um, we're not, because we're not proposing to change anything, uh, if we were not successful with the board this evening, it doesn't mean that one of the houses is going to cease to exist. They're still there, and they would still function as they have been functioning, which means fully habitable, independent of the other. So that wouldn't change anything other than the hardship being because they want to be able to sell the, pro the, the houses. And if they'd had an interested party saying, oh, sure, this is cool, but the price isn't right, what, and they can certainly verify this, they've had 
a lot of interest again, but nobody wants to buy a lot with two houses on it. So an easy retort might be, well, get rid of one of the houses, but that suddenly then flies in the face of criteria number one, saying is there a hardship here? Yes, there would be, because you'd be getting rid of basically half of the value, and in Higgins Beach, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars just gone uh, because of something that the current family didn't do. Yes, it was in their family when they did it, but when they did it, there was no issue as far as this was concerned because there was no zoning. So again, we're not changing the dynamic of anything in the neighborhood or on the lot, even with the line the way we show it, because when people pull up, when the cottages are fully rented, which they almost exclusively are during the summertime uh, or in the season, uh, there are people in the front cottage and people in the back cottage, and they seem to be able to make it work quite well with parking on the lot, which, again, is not going to change. The downside, though, is the third question, which is the granting of this variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or the locality. <clears throat> in a sense, in my opinion, by allowing you to build or allow a building to be acknowledged as a second lot without any road frontage, my question would be, does that change the character of the neighborhood? Because you wouldn't let them construct that up front from the beginning, but now we're looking for a variance to allow it. So in my opinion, that does change the character of the neighborhood because now you're saying, well, anybody can put a second building behind the one that they've got and we'll functionally split it off and it's good. Now the instance here, since the building's been on the lot from the beginning, since before we had these uh, rules, it gets a variance review. Right. You're absolutely right. A bu building of, well, any building like this that would be other than a garage or a barn or something to that effect, any building that's habitable um, since the enactment of zoning in Scarborough, well, pretty much in any town, would not be allowed to be built. Uh, you can't have other than a, like an additional dwelling unit that has to go under the provisions of the approval with the main building. That's not the case here. So, again, we're not really changing the dynamic of anything. It's going to look exactly the same as it did before. Is it precedent setting? I don't believe so because not only have we done it before, but there are quite a number of lots actually at Higgins Beach that are even small, believe it or not, um, that are smaller than this one. In fact, I'd call you if you're interested, I'd call your attention to the tax map and you can see several of those lots in the immediate vicinity that are considerably smaller than we're even asking for both of these lots or each one of these lots as it were. So I don't think that the, uh, my opinion would be that from a perspective of what's this going to do to the neighborhood, I don't think it's going to do anything because we're not proposing to build anything or change anything other than putting a line on the ground and allow the properties to be uh, inhabited separately or sold separately. So based on that, if you don't think it changes the character, are any of these other properties that have been split off and now have two <coughs> non-conforming lots connected, are they two structures that are this close? Are they that close to the property line that you have a hard time getting a driveway back to the back property. In fact, there is a yes is the answer to your question. Okay. I would just use one particular example, and please feel free, I won't mention the name, but uh, yeah. if you drive down uh, Ocean Avenue, which is the main drag down to uh, into Higgins Beach, um, on the left-hand side you will see just past the, uh, uh, the town's property, there is a uh, house with two cottages. They look very much they're painted the same scheme. We did this a couple of years ago. Uh, one of those lines was separate. The, the two from the main house to the first cottage is four feet, and there's a line that now goes down the, the middle of those to be able to separate them out. And that was almost the, exactly the same situation. Uh, they had existed for decades. They could not. So the the owners, who are still the current owner of the house, but not the two cottages, had actively marketed them. And again, they had interest. Somebody wanted to buy a cottage, but not three. Uh, so it worked out quite nicely this way and to be able to uh, separate that out. But you, wouldn't, you don't see any other changes. They are as they've always been. They're just sitting on their own lots as opposed to one. Did those properties need variances? Yes. And we got that from this board. How long ago? About two years ago. That's true. I don't remember that. I don't remember that at all. Um, there's a couple that's even one on that street that we've done, uh, just up maybe about five houses up that we also did one although there are different circumstances and there is no precedent. Um, we have done it in the past. I'd also remind the board that just last year you had a very similar request which you denied. So there's a precedent for denial as well. And, and, and there is no precedent if, if a, an approval was granted in error. There's, there's no reason why you need to compound that error by making the same error over and over again. The crux, as I see it, is you're creating a non-conforming lot. You cannot do that. There is no street frontage for this lot. 
you're creating a non-conforming lot, and, and by doing that, you're encouraging that same thing to happen. The whole purpose of zoning is to eliminate non-conformance, not encourage it. And that's, in my opinion, <coughs> what was happening here. The next thing that would happen is the new owners of the separate properties would want to come in and they'd seek variances to tear down their structures and rebuild, furthering the non-conformance, and it, it makes no sense to me. That's that's my mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think my biggest issue is probably the side setback. I think if a car goes up and, and parks at the front edge of that, I'm, my concern is that they're going to be encroaching on the neighbor's property just to get around to theirs. And you're probably right. I mean, literally, let's call it what it is. Yes, if you open your car door and step out on somebody else's property, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, but, again, we're not changing the dynamic of the lot. Nothing out there. If the board doesn't vote in favor, which is certainly within your right, it's not going to change anything in terms of the physical structure of the setup of this lot. It's going to remain exactly as you see it. The only issue would be, as Brian the codes officer mentioned, um, is that uh, a new owner might come back and say, okay, I'd like to be able to do this, uh, whatever this is. In that situation, however, unlike the house already being there, uh, if they wanted to tear down the house, they would still have to build within that existing building envelope, which would, does exist as far as these houses are concerned. Now, somebody could still ask the board to make an exception to that as well, and that's certainly within the board's purview to do it or not. Um, in this case, it's just we're not changing anything. The future could hold who knows what. Um, you're right. You, we may get somebody tomorrow that says comes in and, and offers to buy both houses. But it hasn't happened, and believe me, they've tried. They didn't want to have to go through this process. They just wanted to sell the houses. Uh, they just can't find any interested parties who are, without beating the dead horse, interested in buying two complete houses on one lot. Therein lies our quandary. I, I think I have three problems with it. Um, one is the street frontage. There is no really street frontage. Two is the parking. It's extremely close, and I mean, it, it's something people have probably been parking or getting out on someone else's property for years where they've been renting it. But dividing it up and making it two separate properties, I have an issue with that, and I don't think that it fits one. I don't think there is, there could be a return. It doesn't need to be of value. They can still continue to rent these properties and keep them in the family and continue to do what they're doing, that's still a return on the property. They're still getting money for someone coming and renting those properties. That's, if I may, um, that you're right. That's certainly an option, but there's a certain point in everyone's life where they just say, we can't deal with two houses anymore. We sometimes they say, we can't even deal with one. And if they're then stuck with a property that they can't sell because there's literally no buyer because no buyer wants to buy two structures on the same lot, then that becomes tantamount to saying, sorry, you've got a great lot and a great beach area, but if you can't sell it and you want to, it almost makes it valueless. But by the same token, if you've got a buyer that really wants that property bad enough, they're going to buy the property and tear one of the structures down. There too. And, if they and want it bad enough, if they really want to live down there, there's limited space down there. And you're absolutely right. And notwithstanding some of the recent activity on double lots that are down there where some people have done just that, uh, this lot... And let's face it, anything could be done, but this lot isn't that large to be able to typically entice most people to pay the money for two houses to tear one of the, to tear basically both of them down and then rebuild another one. Are there people out there? Probably, but nobody's come forward in the three years that it's been marketed. Nobody at all. Sure. And I'd like to, one more thing. I would like sure. to point out, it's, it is very narrow, but there is street frontage. Uh, that's what this panhandle is. It does actually come out to the public right away. It's not like a back lot that cannot be accessed. Here are some of the concerns that I see. Um, there, in the past, we have allowed for the functional division, if you, if you, using that word as we have, but there's been a a standard that we've applied in the in the past 10 years that, that I still believe in, and uh, whether or not we'd survive a court case is one conversation with that standard, and that's typically if you drive by it and it looks like two houses, the separate, not contained, and we have nobody complaining or saying they've got a challenge with it. And they're separate by nature. If you you look at it and you go, yeah, it makes sense. We have, in the past, bent that, and I have no pride to stand with that forever, as far as that logic, because I do believe it makes sense when you can divide two pieces for everybody. It increases the value for the town, increases the value for the neighbors, 
it increases the value for the people that own the property. So I philosophically do not have a problem with the functional dis um, uh, separation. However, there are a couple things in this that are interesting. The property tax bill only shows the one piece. There is no 17. There is no lot 17 in town. It's only 19. Um, and it doesn't reference any of the back property when you look at the tax bill. The taxes, in fact, are considerably lower than some of the others in the neighborhood. So it's it seems to be, um, and, and it's it's uh, valued uh, lower than some. So it's for whatever reason, uh, nobody in the last whatever number of years has taken into consideration that back lot, that, that back building, as having any real value. Um, otherwise, the taxes ref reflect that with the square footage. Uh, it doesn't even show; it shows a half bath, and that's it uh, in the maps. Um, the other challenges I have are the same as the rest of the board uh, with the access. And um, although, again, I come back with, I'm a little bit uh, not the same place that uh, Mr. Longstaff is in, I don't have a problem with the concept. And I don't have a problem, w I'm not sure it would handle in court. And that's the reality is uh, we've got two complaints saying they don't want it. We've got a, a picture that doesn't, it isn't consistent with what we've done in the past. And from a logical point of view, I can't argue a logical argument for it other than, which is exactly what you state, um, it is what it is. And I mean, you're absolutely correct. So the, the personal side of me says, I can't disagree with your facts. They are, whatever we do here, it's going to be the same. Um, but we also know, and we have one coming up next, that these are going to want to be rebuilt, as Mr. Longstaff stated. And if the right buyer would look at that and they came to the board and said, we'd like to actually take that same footprint, move it toward the front of the house, and build a larger single-family home, I would argue that that's a lot of value because they could come in and build a brand new home, and this board more than likely would approve that behavior because we have in the past. I can't guarantee that, but when I look at that, I could actually see leverage for the argument that when most people are buying, and there's been a lot of sales in the last... 10 years on that street. Uh, almost half the properties have sold in the last 10 years on that street and been remodeled, um, which is fascinating. Um, so I'm struggling with this one, and I, uh, but uh, I'll stop there. But, but I have to be candid with you that this isn't the norm of what we've allowed us, what we've allowed ourselves to take liberty with. We've got two complaints. It's a different set of circumstances. There is no access really for a driveway. Uh, I can see a, a very easily a feud with two different people owning the properties and, and down the road. And I, I don't think we're doing anybody a favor long term in separating these properties. I, I do think as uh, we can talk at a different time, there is an all other alternatives. One of those being is exactly as I described, uh, but I can't support it. My initial thought, one of my initial thoughts was when the people go to that back property in the winter, If how do you clear your driveway and where do you put the snow? Or how do you clear a path with very little access to that back part of the lot? I mean, you have to put your snow on someone else's property, I think. Well, I mean, practically, realistically, you're probably absolutely correct. Legally, if somebody put up a fence on the other side property or in this area right in here, which is, would be the, the abutter, for instance, if they put a fence there, which is certainly yeah. their legal right to do. Um, you could actually, there's six feet, pretty narrow, but it's doable yeah. to the point where the snow can actually be pushed back here to be able to get it into that area. Challenging, as far as snow is concerned, sure, but certainly but, doable. But that's assuming we've got, a, we've got a violation, we've got an encroachment on the other property there uh, with that driveway. Uh, that's the extent. It's a gravel driveway, and, and we tried to show it in the survey as to what literally is out there when you can see it in the summertime. So, yes, there is an encroachment there. Does it need to be there? Not really. It's convenient, but from yeah. a legal perspective, it wouldn't have to be. I mean, if, somebody, if the abutter did put a fence there, we wouldn't have any choice. It would have to be that way anyway. Other board members? Comments, questions, or motion? I'd have a hard time supporting it. So what I'd like to do is go through the uh, the criteria. 
and let each of us discuss our, our issues on this as to what, and I don't know where the vote will go on it at this point, but <clears throat> I have, Can I ask yes. one more question before sure. we go in that direction? Um, did you consider potentially trying to join the two structures in a remodel of some type? You, like physically joining them? Yeah. No. I mean, not to my knowledge. I don't. Would you like to? Yeah. You're, ab Certainly. you're absolutely Certainly. like Certainly. So Go over to the microphone, please. If you could state your name and address, please. You're absolutely welcome to speak as much as you like. This is important. Thank you. I do appreciate your considering this. I know it's taking your time. My name is Judith Lowell. I live at 28 Woodside Drive in Cumberland Center. My grandfather built both cottages. They've been in our lives ever since we were born and before. One thing I think, I don't know if I'm correct in saying this, but uh, I'm a visual person. You don't have time to drive to Higgins Beach and see these cottages, but if you did, it's possible you would have a slightly different perspective. I don't know. Um, they're very charming. We've kept them up for many years perfectly. We've had hundreds of tenants over many years who are just thrilled to be there every summer. It's been a happy, happy place, both cottages. The style of them is very different. I don't know if this is relevant. Um, yeah, feel free to ahead. The people who have expressed interest have been struck by the style of each and both. Some people like the style that's different of the front one, and some people like the style of the back one, which is really news to us. We had no idea how people would react to either of them or both of them on a purchasing, you know, in a purchasing situation. So we've learned a lot, and um, I can give you that feedback, and I, I don't know about how, if it affects anything or if it means anything to you, but they're not dumps. You know, they're charming, and they're, people just love them, that our tenants and our families who would love to buy them if they could afford them. But anyway, that's, I just wanted to throw that in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, feel free to take the microphone. One more thing. Sure. The driveway issue. I know it's, we're talking small spaces. There's never been a problem with the driveways. I, we've always driven in those driveways. I, I, I don't know. I think you'd have to see them. Just, you're not jamming cars into driveways at all, I, I don't think, the width at all. There have been people who have rented both of them who know each other at the same time in the summer and in early fall. There have peop been people who have been strangers renting them. We've never had a complaint about cars, We've n it's, which is amazing. And we have had many tenants who have been there for many years and continue to come back, which is wonderful for us. But I don't know. I just that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank Pro you for the only that. problem with that being with the driveways is these are now going to be year-round driveways and they're going to be used in the winter and things too. And you're going to have two separate owners. Where you haven't had that now, that's what we have to look at it. From if you could approach the podium, please. Th Thank you. How would it be different in the winter if you have the same situation of someone in the rear cottage, someone in the front cottage with cars? How would it be different besides snow? Be that's, that's the essential the difference. Only, You've got two yeah. separate owners. You're going to have to put with the snow in main winters. You can get some pretty significant snowfall. Yeah. There's not a lot of room to put that. And you've got two owners now. You don't have people just coming in the summer or the fall now. Yes. You have people that are living there year-round yes. and looking well, for other things. That's they're not we winterized, though. What's they're that? not winterized. No, but if someone buys them, most likely they're going to either renovate or make them winterized. Most of the properties we see down there, people come before us and want to make those a year-round property. Oh, interesting. That's the perspective. We have to look at it. Yes, of course. That as well. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If you could just state your name and address. Charlotte Lowell Heard, 2 Wildwood Boulevard, Cumberland Forestside, Maine. Uh, I'm a co-owner along with my sister. Um, I came to the town office about five to eight years ago, thank you very much, and spoke with the, I guess, code enforcement officer um, with the notion of what would happen to that one lot with two cottages on it if 
they were leveled and somebody wanted to build one property, one, one structure on that property. And my, the answer that I got with the current setbacks from Scarborough, the structure would be about eight feet wide. It would be very long and narrow. Let me explain a little bit to that. Uh, yeah. the, the code enforcement officer's job is to tell you what the rules are. The, this board's job is to, to override those rules when we can, provided we meet all the requirements. And that's why the Zoning Board of Appeals exists. Uh, but the code enforcement officer told you the truth. Historically and practically, what we have done is, if it's in the same footprint or if it's moved but into a better location, and still the same square footage, this board has, I think, almost always uh, allowed for that to be rebuilt in the same footprint. Uh, and if it's more, if it's put more in conformance, that's even a better reason. In, in an example of combining these two units together, uh, I would, I can't say how I'd vote on it because it's, it's, it's not real, but if it happened, historically, we would, we would argue to give you that same square footage in one piece. So although the code enforcement officer gave you the facts, which is right, why, that, that's why we're here. Yeah, once you level the existing building, you do have to go by the new guidelines, which is tighter on the property. Right. And if you were to connect those two buildings in one structure, then you'd have to come for us to us for a variance. But if you weren't changing the envelope where those existing buildings were and just doing an interconnection of the buildings, we I can't say that we would probably approve that, but uh, I think you'd have a higher likelihood of success. So if we were to sell these, again, trying to sell them as two properties, two structures on one lot, which nobody's interested in, how do we can't say to these potential buyers, you can go ahead and knock them down, but you're going to have to come back to the same board and get a variance for what you want to put up. What you could do, and I, we're a little bit out of scope here, but but I, but I want to make sure you know what you. This is a long time home, and it's important, and I want to make sure that we we hear you out. The the if that happened, uh, you would have a contract subject to the board approving a the property being able to be rebuilt, in, in uh, and so that's how typically it would play out. For instance. Uh, if I were going to do it, I'd have a contract saying I'd like to buy these, this home, but I need to make sure that I can take this, this back property, take the square footage, and build on to the back of the existing property, keep the existing property the same footprint, but move this other piece over. And if the board grants that, then we'll consummate the sale. That's very common. Um, has that happened at Higgins? Can't say that it has. But has it happened at Scarborough? I'm sure it has. I'm sure that, that kind of situation where you need to get a – somebody wants something specific, but they need the town to okay it, that's a common issue. It's not not daily, but it's certainly reasonable, and um, it, it, that, that would be a very reasonable alternative, um, and that would allow more opportunity. So in a conversation with a buyer, you could certainly suggest that. And, and as you know, it's not that expensive to come before the board – to, to get that approval if such is granted. And it would, I think, bring a lot of value to somebody that wanted to build a new home uh, on that property. And we are seeing uh, that's the case. Most of these people are buying the homes and tearing them down and then rebuilding in the same footprint. And there are numerous examples of that. But they're buying, they're not buying two structures on one lot. If we, we would have to lower our price to really accommodating only one structure because nobody wants to come in and buy two cottages and level them, pay the money to level them, pay the money for two cottages and one lot, pay the money to level them, and then build new. That's what we're running into. Realistically, if, if you're looking for maximum return, the maximum return would, would be us granting variance to allow you to sell these as separate lots and separate homes, and in fact, that would be a true statement. But in this case, at least from the sound of the board, you're not going to be able to get the board's four votes that you need to be able to get that, I doubt it. You may, but I, I and we three actually. Thank you. Um, to get that, you may. I, I, I for one, am against it, and I think you're hearing some other board members the same way. 
I know it's the wrong answer, but especially with the two people that have said that they have an issue with it, that really creates a problem. Because to be candid with you, the we stretch the rule when we approve those, and we know it. That the, the Soccer River Corridor is much more complicated than it appears. It's uh, it, it has a lot of variables to it. You can never really compare one evenly. And I, I just it, our job is to keep us out of court too. You know, our job is to make sure that we do something that's right. And if nobody cares, life's a lot easier. But you've got people that have a concern. It doesn't. It isn't consistent with anything the board has done in the past. And I understand that you'd love to be able to get the value for the square footage. What you're really losing in value, which isn't even calculated in your taxes, is the square footage of that back building. If you if you look at the honest reality, you're pricing it based on the square footage of usable space, not two not two units. So that's where you're getting your issue. The land is the land. And that, that carries a lot of weight. There's a lot of value there. Thank you. I'm sorry. Anybody else uh, want to speak? Yes. I'd certainly um, let you. I'm to say quick. Go right ahead. Um, I'm unfamiliar with these processes, but. And, and could we you didn't state your know. name again, Pardon please? Me. Judith Lowell. Thank you. Is that. Yep, that's good. Okay. Um, I didn't know there were people mailing letters to you. I don't even know the people. We don't know the people. Is that we shouldn't have gotten copies of the letters, right? They would go to you, right? They come to us. Okay. Uh, yes, and and we can give you copies if you'd like. It's okay. public record, so okay. you're welcome to them. Yeah, my, for our records, we might as well. Thank Certainly. you. Uh, Mr. Fisher, I'll let you close up before we make the next step. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, given the consequence of the unofficial poll, as it were, um, and uh, given the consequence of what a, uh, a negative vote would be, um, I'd like to be able to have a, mo a bit of time to be able to uh, confer with our clients. So if it pleases the, uh, the board, we'd like to be able to table this um, at, the mo at this moment, and then uh, we will let you know, we'll let Brian know um, as we go forward very soon. Okay. So uh, like uh, based on the applicant's request, I have moved to table to the next meeting. If the next meeting uh, we don't, uh, you decide not to come back, then it will be dropped and left as uh, unvoted, not voted on. Second. Okay. All in favor? Rick. All David, that's unanimous. Thanks for your Thank time. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't help you on this. Uh, do we have? It's a lovely property. I can yeah. I can mail those to you, but can I have your full address again, Judith? Do we have a second appeal? Uh, no, the second appeal to ask the table till next Judith month. Judith okay. Lowell, 28, 28 Woodside Drive, Cumberland Center, Maine. Where is it? Cumberland. Oh, Center, Cumberland. Maine. I'm sorry. Okay. It's my yep. parents' house who had these yep. cottages also. <laughs> okay. If you could stay for a minute afterwards, I'd love to chat with you. If you could stay for a minute, I'd love to chat with you afterwards. Uh, so, uh, that's the meeting tonight. That's all we've got. Um, no. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, we have a a letter uh, asking to table the second okay. uh, This is uh, from uh, Kevin Coyne. As I mentioned, I'm interested in incorporating a garage in my design. At this time, I'd like to table my request in preparation to present for the next month's meeting. Uh, please call or email me. So I'll, I'll move that we uh, grant the request to table to the next month's meeting, put it first on the agenda. Great. Second Great. from uh, Mr. Stark. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Actually, no discussion on it. Sorry. Sorry, that's unanimous. Um, long staff unit? That is the agenda, I believe. No, yeah, please hold on to those two appeals since they're both tabled. Any comments? Um, did you ask about comments? Yes, yeah, we're just getting right there. And why don't we start with you? <laughs> you, you sensed that I had, had, you had comments. comments. <laughs> yeah, now i got to find my uh, notes. Um, the, the uh, first comment was uh, just wanted to remind folks that there is an upcoming, if you haven't taken uh, Planning Board or Board of Appeals training, there is an upcoming opportunity. Um, there it is. On uh, uh, February 10th in Augusta, uh, the training
meetings put on by the Maine Municipal Association for planning boards and boards of appeal. Um, it's $55 per person. We would cover that, the town would cover that, as well as mileage um, to attend that meeting if anyone's interested. Okay. Really good training. I think I'd like to do that. Yep. Contact. Just contact me after. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mr. Stark and I attended it last year, and it was worth it. It was worth it. Yep. Very, very, Did you very say that? It's yep. great. Very, very good. Very good. You'll walk out a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to recommend though, if you haven't had an opportunity to do it and you can do it, it's great. It's, and, and even as a refresher, even if you've had it, but it's been years, it's great um, yeah. because lot, the rules change, the laws yeah. change. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we are moving now into 2015 into um, electronic submittals. And so if you check the website, um, we are requesting electronic submittals as well as the paper copies that we've always had. And that will help us um, conserve filing space. And it'll also help us post these um, agendas and the, the materials online easier. Are you going to send that to us as well electronically, rather than deliver to our homes? Um, we, we may, we very well could move in that direction if it is the if it is the board's desire to do that. I'm sure we would have no arguments from staff um, to do that. And the challenge is going to be computer laptops. It's, it, it, some of the materials may be difficult to read um, at the scale that you're Right. I'm thinking about. the drawings might be more difficult, but the, the literature that goes along with it? Yeah. It could be. But, yeah, a lot of the documents can certainly be emailed. Um, mm -hmm. So we can look into that and talk about that uh, later, and I, I would uh, entertain a discussion about that with yeah, the great. chairman and anyone that's interested in doing that. Uh, that's all I have. That's all I have. Uh, yeah, Mr. Longstaff and I took the class, was it two years ago now? And it was very informative. That was in Saco, which was much closer, though. <laughs> when we start that, is there any comments? I have one. Sure. As usual. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Mr. Dillon. I wasn't here at his last meeting. And uh, Art served us well. And uh, from a town standpoint, from a board standpoint, I'd like to thank him for his efforts and uh, what he did for the board. He certainly helped us out. And, we uh, we appreciate what he's done and, and uh, wish him well in his future endeavors. Definitely. Absolutely. Mr. Clarkett? I'm good. Mr. Okay. Sock? Uh, I'll reiterate uh, what Rick said about uh, Art Dillon. Uh, did a great job. Uh, has a very busy schedule. Uh, does numerous things. And he's been very valuable over the years. And uh, we're glad that he was here. I have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Um, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs>